So I want to start by talking about, and the title would be Reflection. Reflection. I want to talk about reflection. I, I don't know if you've ever caught yourself in, in, a, in a mirror as you walk by or maybe a reflection uh, as, as you're walking by, maybe a, a, a window, maybe you're at the mall shopping and, and all of a sudden, and you catch yourself, you catch a reflection and you go, whoa, is that me? And, and it could be good, it could be bad. You, you know what I'm talking about. I, I'll, I'll never forget, a number of years ago, I was in a parking lot. And I walked by a minivan, and you know, a minivan's got a big back window, and I walked by a minivan, and I looked, because they had a sticker on the minivan, I wanted to read the sticker, but I caught my reflection. And, and I was not impressed. <laughs> I was a little worried. I, I, I caught my reflection, and I'm sure it was just the way the sun was shining. I, I, I'm sure it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, variables that I couldn't control because the man in that reflection couldn't be that old. <laughs> he couldn't possibly have all those wrinkles. And I literally, it stopped me in my track, and I looked in, the, in that window, and thank God nobody was in there. They would have been totally freaked out, right? So I'm looking in that window, and I'm going, my Lord, you could plant corn in those crevices. I mean, literally, I was shocked. I was surprised by my reflection. What is a reflection? Well, a reflection defined is to think carefully about. You reflect on something. But it goes further than that, to give back an image, to, to throw back light or sound. Reflection. A, a, a reflection can deceive. A reflection can deceive. Uh, you know, when I was on that motorcycle ride, we were going through the Mojave Desert, 120 plus degrees. It was hot. And all of a sudden, I saw what we know as a mirage. What is a mirage? Well, a mirage is, is simply an optical illusion caused by the reflecting and bending of rays of light by a layer of heated air. Well, man, I was in an area of heated air. And I looked across this barren landscape. I, 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 I looked, and I mean, it is so hot. You know, every once in a while, you've got to give your hand a rest. You're on that, on that throttle or you're on that, uh, the other handlebar, and sometimes you just got to give your hand a rest. Put it on cruise control and shake, the, shake my hand out a little bit. Sometimes you put it out so the wind will hit it, dry it off. I mean, I put my hand out, and my hand would burn. It was so hot. It was just crazy amount of heat. But I looked off in the distance in that barren uh, landscape, and, and I swear there was a lake out there. It was this massive lake, and I just, I mean, I'm riding, and I'm just staring at that lake and staring at that lake, and that lake just goes on for miles and miles and miles and miles. And all of a sudden, I realized there's no lake over there. That is a mirage. Reflections, the way the light rays were hitting and bending and the way it re interacts with the heat, it was creating a deceptive Reflection. So reflections can deceive. Reflections can distort. Have you ever gone in front of a carnival mirror? A circus mirror, carnival mirror? You ever do something like that? You walk in front of that? Actually, I've got an app on my phone that I love to play with. I love to send uh, my grandkids these uh, videos and even, even my kids and some of my siblings, I've done it. Uh, go ahead and show that next uh, Okay, they deceive, but you missed the next one. They, okay, they distort. They distort. So go, uh, show that picture how, how uh, see, see, see certain, certain ways. I mean, that is me. <laughs> Believe it or not, that is me. How many, of you, how many of you want that app now, right? It's an awesome app. I've had it for a long time. I guess you got to pay for it now. But see, that is a reflection of me. That is actually me. But somehow that reflection has been distorted. Reflections can deceive. They, they, they may be a mirage. They can distort. But reflections also reveal. They reveal. Like it or not, a mirror can tell us 
a story. A mirror can reveal the truth that we'd rather not know. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You stand in front of a mirror and you say, oh, wow, the COVID-15 has become COVID-17. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? But, but mirrors, they, they, can, they can deceive, they can distort, but, but they can also reveal, they can reveal truth to us. So I'm, I'm going to take kind of a, kind of a right turn here and, 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 and talk about something. It, it all relates, you'll get it. But as I was growing up, in the, in the elementary school especially growing up, I don't remember it as much in junior high, probably because I don't remember much about junior high or high school. I just didn't like it. I had a lot of fun, I had a lot of friends, but I didn't like school. But I remember in, junior, in, in elementary school, every day of my life began the same way once I got into school. When the bell rang, the teacher expected our attention, amen, expected order, and expected every student to stand up and do what? We had to recite the pledge, right? The Pledge of Allegiance. So, so uh, you know, we would recite this Pledge of Allegiance, and, and as you know, at the very end, it says, one nation under God, Amen. right? And I know there's a lot more to it. it. In fact, when I served for five and a half years on the uh, Warren Planning Commission, every meeting started with the Pledge of Allegiance. One nation under God. Everybody say that. One nation under God. Say it again. One nation under God. God. See, there actually was a time when that was true. Unfortunately, I think that statement is now more mere words. Christian, you want some good news? You want some good news right now? Christianity is, is right this moment the largest religion on the planet about two and a half to two and three quarters billion people embrace Christianity. Yeah. Come on, that, that's a good thing, amen? It is, the largest, it is the largest population serving our God. Two and a half to two and three quarter billion people. So that's the good news. That is the good news, and I, I, I love to hear that. Uh, but almost every study of Christianity today in, in America, that is, says that our one nation under God has now become a post-Christian nation. I got to tell you, I heard that a few years ago and it made me mad because I thought I was hearing it from a liberal who is making a statement slamming our country and I didn't like what he said. What do you mean we're a post-Christian nation? No, we're not. We are still one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's us. Praise the Lord. But I got to tell you, the more I've studied it, the more I've looked at it, the more I realize that it is true that this is a post-Christian nation. That's a sad fact. That's a very sad fact. I understand we're a melting pot. I understand all those things. I understand everybody's not going to embrace what we believe. I understand that any government that tries to force people to worship a certain way is why we left England in the first place. Nobody's going to make us do. We want to do it freely. We want to worship him freely. Can you say amen to that? But we have become a post-Christian nation. Why do they say that? Why do they say that? What is post-Christian? And why do they say that? Post-Christian, listen to this definition. It won't be on the screen, so listen. It's a society where Christianity is no longer the dominant religion, but has gradually accepted the values and worldview of a culture that are clearly not biblical not Christian. That's a post-Christian nation. 
Now, I'm not saying that the world has become that. I'm talking about our land. I'm talking about our nation. I'm talking about these United States of America. I am not trying to bring an indictment about, uh, against our country. This is not about nationalism. This is not about uh, the United States. It is about us. It is about the church. Why are they saying that we are a post-Christian nation? Listen to these statistics about the American church. 70% of churchgoers believe everyone now goes to heaven. Everyone. 70% of people in church believe everybody goes to heaven, no matter what they do, no matter how they live, accept Jesus, reject Jesus, everybody goes to heaven. Now listen, maybe all dogs go to heaven, but not every human. 70%. 30% of evangelicals say that Jesus was a good teacher, but not God. Only 8% church attenders believe it's important to share their faith. 78% of the unchurched say they would listen to somebody if they came to them and shared their faith. There's a void out there, my friend. Only 8% think it's a good idea. 78% want to hear it. 34% Christian adults aren't sure about the virgin, virgin birth. 52% of Christians believe that non-Christian faiths can also lead to salvation. 50% of uh, people age 18 to 24, if you're 18 to 24, listen to this, do not believe the Bible is literally God's word to them. 50%. 60% of millennials consider pornography acceptable. Only half of pastors have a biblical worldview today. What is a biblical worldview? It says, what do, I, what do I believe about the world? What do I believe about society, about culture? What does the Bible say about it? Then that's what we need to believe for the world. Amen? That's a biblical worldview. So, so the statistic is only half of pastors have a biblical worldview. 24 of 25 millennials do not believe a biblical worldview is important. Could it be because 50% of pastors don't believe it's important? Why am I saying this? Why am I telling you all this? You're like, Pastor, we, we came to hear something good. We came to hear good news today. Oh, I'll tell you what, you want some good news? Three of you want good news. Where are you? Come up here. I want to talk to you. <laughs> Anybody want some good news today? Let me, let me tell you. Let me tell you what we embrace as a church here at Grace. You may be a first-time guest here. You may be a long-time attender. You may be a member, and you don't even know some of the things we embrace as a church. Well, guess what? You're going to hear them now. Yes. What do we embrace as a church? I, I want it to be very clear that what we believe as a church is that, number one, according to Isaiah 59, 2, our sinful condition has separated us from God. Sin did that. Uh, according to John chapter 14, salvation is through Jesus Christ plus nothing else. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Uh, we believe, according to 2 Timothy 3, in the integrity of the Word of God. The Bible is our only standard for truth. Yes. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yes. Uh, according to Hebrews 11.6, this is a faith church. I am a faith pastor. Yes. And I will not apologize or back down for that. Because it says in that verse, without faith, it's impossible to please God. This church embraces that unconditional love is the language of heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And this church embraces that your words are powerful. You impact your world by your words. We believe in this church, Romans 6.23 and Romans 3.23 is true. The wages of sin is still death. Sin will kill you. It'll destroy your body. It'll destroy your dreams. It'll destroy you. Sin, bad. God, good. 
This church embraces that prosperity and spirit, soul and body are God's idea according to 3 John verse 2. We embrace the fact that according to Psalm 34, 8, that God is a good God, period. Amen. He's a good God. Yeah, but I heard he, no, he's a good God. Yeah, but what about, he's a good God. But I read somewhere in, he's a good God. He's a good God. When you embrace that he is a good God, you will see him differently. And you will reflect him differently. We embrace, according to Acts chapter 2, that the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues is true. It is for us. It is for today. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, he said, and you shall receive, come on, shout it out. You shall receive, you shall receive after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power, and we still need the power. We embrace that healing has been provided for every area of your life. Sozo, salvation, soteria, the word in the Bible, includes healing, preservation, soundness of mind, deliverance, rest, everything you possibly could need is wrapped up in that word. That's what we embrace. You say, I didn't know I went to a church like that. Now you do. Now you know. Now you know, we are a church that is completely, 100% sold out to God. Sold out to knowing Jesus better. Spending time in his presence. Pursuing life-giving encounters with him. Making him known to a world that is lost in pursuit of things that will never satisfy. And, and yet here we are, the church, we're pursuing things that never satisfy. What is our reflection? Amen. What are we reflecting? Who are we reflecting? I, I, I just, I just want to I, I see something fixed here. See, a post-Christian nation is the result of a post-Christian church. A post-Christian church is led by post-Christian compromised leaders, which then produces post-Christian compromised Christians. How many, how many believe in God for an awakening? You, how many believe in God for an awakening, that America needs an awakening? Are, do you believe that? How many believe that? Come on, let me hear a shout from anybody who believes that. We need an awakening. But a nation does not awake. A nation does not awake. Listen, a nation does not change by the change of a nation. A great awakening in a nation does not occur by a nation waking up. An awakening in this nation only occurs when every one of us as individuals embrace the need, the desire, the mandate to reflect the God that we've been made in the image of. The only way an awakening happens is, is, is if I come awake. I want the church to come alive. Then come alive. Yeah. I want the church to wake up. Then wake up. Yeah. It is every individual's responsibility to begin to reflect who we are made in the image of. It is not the nation's responsibility to wake up. It's not the church's responsibility to wake up. The church wakes up. The nation wakes up as we as individuals wake up. We've got to wake up. It's time. It's time for an awakening. Do you believe that? Amen. Look at this scripture, what the Bible says about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 1, in the Message Bible, I know it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase, but I love it. Listen to this. The Son perfectly mirrors God. Oh, don't you love that? You say, well, I wonder, I wonder if God wants me healed. What did Jesus do? He healed. Well, I, wonder, I wonder if he wants me saved. What did Jesus do? He saved. I, well, I wonder, if, I wonder if he wants me delivered from this demonic oppression. What did Jesus do? He was a perfect mirror 
of God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, by his powerful words. That's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Would that be arrogant for Jesus to say that? He was stamped by the very nature of God. Was that arrogant for him to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? I only say what I hear my father say. I only do what I see my father do. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. You want to know what the father's like? Look at my life. Would that be arrogant for Jesus to say that? Would you say that would be arrogant if we got to a place where we could say, you want to know what God's like? Look at the church. Look at the individuals in this church. Look at how we're, we're not perfect. God is perfect. We're not. But man, we are striving to, uh, to reflect the image of the God that we're made in the image of. Amen? Amen. That's got to be our desire. That's got to be our goal. I want to be able to say that I am a reflection of my Father. I, I, I'm a reflection of how He made me, who He made me to be. See, if, if our reflection is distorted from the image of the one who created us, it, it, it's, it's distorted it's distorted when, when we are identified as a church by what we are against more than what we are for. Do you know so much of this world, they know a lot of things that the church is against. We got people picketing. We got people saying, you know, God hates this and God hates that. People are more, they identify the church more with what the church is against than what the church is about and what we're for. That's a distorted reflection, my friend. We have distorted the reflection of the God that we are to be reflecting. It's a distorted reflection. Uh, when, when I'm captivated and paralyzed by the size of my giants rather than the greatness of my God. It is, listen, it is time for the church to come alive. It's, a, it, it's time for every one of us to come alive and say, it doesn't matter how big that giant is. It doesn't matter about unemployment. It doesn't matter about my finances. It doesn't matter. My God is bigger than any problem, any giant, any Goliath that has come to taunt me. My God is bigger. But we give a distorted image because we act like our problems are bigger than our God and we talk to everybody about it. How about we start talking to everybody about how big our God is, how awesome our God is. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. He's Jehovah Shalom. He brings us peace. Come on, amen. He's Jehovah Tzitkanu. He's my righteousness. He's Jehovah Shammah. He's ever with me. He's Jehovah Roe. He's my shepherd. How about we start talking about how awesome our God is and not always about how big our problems are. We distort the image of the one that created us. When I'm more moved by a report from the CDC than motivated by the report of the Lord. We're talking about another shutdown. Not going to happen here. It's not going to happen here. You say, well, you don't care about us. If 38 years of doing this doesn't prove I care for this congregation, then I can't help you change your mind. I've given my life for this church, but I want to tell you something. There's nothing in the Bible that ever said live to protect your life. It didn't. I'm not saying be dumb. I'm not saying do foolish things. I quit licking doorknobs years ago. Yeah, wash your hands, wash your hands. But I'll tell you what, we are never going to shut down again. I don't care if they come and lock me up. This building will never shut down again. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. My God is bigger. My God is bigger. And I'm going to reflect the bigness of God. I'm going to reflect that he is my healer. He is my deliverer. You want hands laid on you? Get in this church, man. We'll lay hands on you. We'll cast out the devil. Come on, we'll pray for you. We'll watch God do amazing things in your life.
but we're never again going to cower in the corner and run from a report. I don't care if it's from Delta or, or, or any other faucet company. I, I couldn't think of anything else. <laughs> De Delta Epsilon, there, there you go. <laughs> I know my Greek. There was an old song, maybe you grew up in the church around that time, Ron Cannoli. All I could think of when I heard Ron Cannoli is just an amazing uh, African-American brother, worship leader. He was so good. And man, he sang the song, Whose Report Will You Believe? But every time I heard his name, I was thinking about, I love cannolis. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was hard to get past that. <laughs> he used to sing that song, Whose Report Will You Believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. You know why? Because his report says that I am healed. His report says I am filled. His report says I am free. His report says victory. So whose report are you going to believe? I, I'm, going to I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. So, so listen, how do we change this? Let me, let me wrap this up. How do we change this? We change this when we see scriptures like James chapter 1. James chapter 1 that says, if you listen to the word and, and don't live out the message you hear. So I don't even believe the word of God is the word of God for me today. You got a problem. You, you got a problem. Right from the get-go, you got a problem. Because if you don't believe that word, that Bible is the anointed word of God for today for you, then this verse means nothing. Take a nap while I read it. But I'm telling you right now, you need to embrace the word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. He says, if you listen to the word and don't live out the message you hear, you become like a person who what? Looks in the mirror of the word to discover the reflection of his face in the beginning. You perceive how God sees you in the mirror of the word, but then you go out and forget your divine origin. How do you fix this? The word. The word is the only fix. It's the only, th good preaching doesn't fix it. Doesn't fix it. Hopefully, it. hopefully it inspires you. Hopefully you remember it beyond lunch today. But it's only the word. Yes, amen. The word, I, my words are not life. My words contain life so long as my words contain the word. Because the word is life. The word is light. Amen? Amen? So, so it's got to be a, a, a recommitment to, to the Bible, the word of God, this scripture that will set you free. It's got to be the only way we change that one nation under God, the only way we come back as a, a, a nation, a nation that is filled with Christianity, Christian principles, Christian morality. A Christian culture is that we as individuals embrace who God intended for us to be. I, I, just, I just believe God's looking for a remnant. There may be only eight people in this room that say, man, that's good, I'm going to do it. You know what? He'll start with eight. That's okay. I'll take eight. Do, do I see eight? Do I, do I see eight hands? One, two, three, four. Oh, that's a little more, but not many, not much. <laughs> he, he starts with a remnant. I believe he's looking for a remnant that will do just as the believers we see in Acts chapter 4. As they were threatened. Threatened by who? Threatened by dignitaries. Threatened by officials. Threatened by people that had authority. Threatened, no more, no more will you preach in that name. You're stirring up trouble. You're making problems for everybody. No more will you preach in that name. He's looking for a remnant that will say, whether it's good with you or not yes, is right. immaterial. Yes. I will do what pleases my God, yes. even if it makes you furious. We've begun to bow to a culture that will cancel us yeah, that's right. just because we disagree with a point they make. It's like, you can't cancel truth. You can compromise it. 
You can shy away from it. Shying away from truth to make peace with somebody is not peace. It's compromise. It's compromise. You know what compromise is? Definition of compromise, it's a harmful or shameful uh, concession. That's, that's what compromise is. It's a harmful or a shameful con, uh, concession. You have conceded. I, I, you know, and somebody says, well, I, I didn't compromise. I just don't say anything. Listen, there's a way to say things, and there's a time to say things. Somebody, somebody that I knew years ago came and met with me uh, a number of weeks ago. And we talked for about, oh, I don't know, about two hours about a lot of different things. And you know what? We didn't agree on almost anything. And I told him as he was leaving, I said, you know, this is the only way these kind of conversations should happen. Eyeball to eyeball, face to face, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. This was a great discussion. We don't agree on much of anything, but this was good. This was awesome. So he began to send me lots of stuff, you know, to make his point over and over. I wouldn't read it, wouldn't look at it. Finally he goes, how come you're not answering me? I said, the only way I have these conversations are face to face, eyeball to eyeball. There's a way to do it. Social media has never been the way to do it. You can say something that makes sense and you'll get canceled, you get, oh my Lord, you'll get beat to a pulp. Why do it? God's looking for a remnant that will say, whether it's right in your eyes or not, I got to obey God. He's looking for a remnant that, that, that will be a vocal reflection of him. You know, in the face of an antagonistic, listen, we live in an anti-Christ culture today. It's not just anti-church, it's anti-Christ. And, and in that culture, God needs a remnant that will speak up. Like Paul said to the Corinthian church, he said, he, he said uh, hold fast to the profession of your faith. The word profession is a compound Greek word, homo legeo, homo to be the same, legeo, to speak the word. Say the same thing God says. He's looking for a remnant that will be verbally reflective of who he is. He's looking for a remnant that will embrace a kingdom pursuit, holy living. Holy living. I'm concerned that people have watched the church and said, why should I live different? All they've done is superimpose Christianity over the lifestyle we all live anyway. That's not right. That's not right. Christianity makes you different. Yes. It's not out of a condemning thing. It's not out of a shaming thing. It's just, listen, if you've been saved for a year and nothing's changed in your life, go back for another dip. God, God will change you from the inside out. He'll do it without condemning you. He will. He'll do it without condemning you. He'll do it without shaming you. Because he loves you. He's a loving father. Amen? Amen. But, but I believe he expected, listen, if we're going to have an awakening, let it be an awakening of holiness. If we're going to have an awakening, we say, well, I want revival. I want revival to break out. I want the Holy Ghost. I want encounters with God. I'll tell you what, in the, in the context of holiness, you can't stop a move of God. He's looking for a remnant that embraces unconditional love without compromising truth. Amen?